Okay, I was born in uh, New Jersey in uh, Patterson General Hospital and then lived in Ridgewood, New Jersey, went through uh, all the public school systems in, uh, in Ridgewood and then uh, graduated from Ridgewood High School. All right, what year were you born? Uh, 1943. Okay, and what did your family do for a living when you were growing up? We lived at a, uh, on the northwest corner of uh, Ridgewood and uh, my father at that time commuted into New York City. And so um, he would get up on the train and uh, leave and then come back in the evening and then um, we were at that corner on that northwest where the school system started with elementary school which was close and then middle school got further away and by the time high school came it was on the way on the other side of time with no uh, school buses so we had to figure out how to get to school every day. <laughs> All right. Uh, what kind of job did your father have? He was in the insurance industry and interestingly enough was a hull secretary and uh, hull secretaries insured ships. Okay. So he was with Atlantic Mutual Marine Insurance which uh, sort of got me interested at that time in boats. All right. Uh, okay, now what did you do after you finished high school? What did I do? Yeah. Yes. All right, so uh, immediately upon uh, graduation, the question is where did you go to college? So I was one of the few that went south. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I went to the University of North Carolina. Okay, and why did you go there? Uh, they had an, a Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps program, so it was called the NROTC. Mm -hmm. So I entered that. Um, in conjunction with going to college and it uh, paid for a portion of the education and it was a full almost like immersion into naval history and you also spent each summer aboard a ship and then upon graduation um, you uh, received an ensign designation and then from there had the opportunity to share what kind of ships you might be interested on, and from there your naval career would, would get underway, so. Okay. Now, did you go into this with the idea of actually maybe having a career in the Navy, or was it I just did. something to do? Okay. I did. Didn't work out that way full time, but uh, I did have an idea in the back of my mind um, about that. Okay. And uh, did you start college in 61? Is that? Yes. Okay. All right, so at that point, there, there, there's no hot war going on. There is a cold one, right. uh, but not that. All right, uh, now you were talking a little bit about the way the uh, ROTC program was structured. You mentioned that you, you went aboard ships during the summer. So what ships did you go to and what were you doing? Right, so I could remember several of them. Uh, one, and again, these were not necessarily all the types. So I was aboard a submarine, um, which was the harder. And uh, these were deployed usually along the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So I remember several of the deployments being either out of Norfolk or out of Charleston. Uh, a second one was uh, the USS Recovery, very interesting ship, which was a rescue ship. And so these were usually a few week deployments um, where you would go aboard uh, for training in a different area. And then you would sort of see, I remember also going uh, down uh, to flight school, looking at that, determining that that was probably not going to be something that I would uh, long term uh, get engaged with. So I was out of Pensacola, so I think maybe that was my third summer. Mm -hmm. So you just get a little bit of a variety, and then you would come back with those experiences and then get back immersed into uh, the full ROTC program. So I was called what they call a two by six which is a minimum of two years active and a minimum of four years reserve as your commitment to that program. Interestingly enough, I uh, recently went back uh, to the uh, reunion and it was one of the strongest showings of any, whether you picked a sorority or picked any group at, at uh, UNC, I was moved by it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the people who had served in Vietnam and other areas um, all came back. And of course, nobody had ever followed anybody for all that period of time, but we had a chance for three hours to just get together. Mm -hmm. And it was very quiet um, in terms of, I, I don't usually share what I'm gonna share. Um, and it's just because that's just the nature of, of the service. Mm -hmm. And so, but I saw such a strong kind of like commitment to some of the things that we were about to engage that these uh, 
these fellow ensigns and others came back to, uh, to see each other. So there was a camaraderie that was there that I just missed, mm -hmm. but we had a chance to see the camaraderie many, 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 many years later. Now, was this a 50th anniversary yeah, thing? Yeah, it was 50th, yeah. 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 Okay. Just now, went through that. It was very moving. All right. So you're basically in college in 61 to 65. Correct. And over the course of that time, the country is kind of leaning toward right. the actual conflict in Vietnam. Did you pay much attention to the news of the world while you were in college, or did you just stay focused on your own stuff? I, I was aware, but boy, was I focused. Um, because even though you don't get a degree in naval science, per se, you're taking all those courses, and then you're also looking at a BS, which I was trying to do. So it was a fascinating thing. So it was a lot of, a lot of schoolwork at that time. Okay. So I was fairly focused, probably not as aware of current events at that time, mm -hmm. um, but it, it, was, it was focused. Because you had to go to drilling as well, and you mm -hmm. had your own obligations um, to the... Uh, um, not just to the ROTC but program, but to those on campus that would engage the, the, the training program. And so there was mm -hmm. constantly something going on all the time. Okay. Uh, now, did things like, um, I guess, the Cuban Missile Crisis or the Kennedy assassination? Kennedy assassination. Affect sure. things? Yeah, yeah. So that sort of heightened it. It's like, wow, these things really can happen. And not so much what your role is going to be in it now, but it was more like the Scouts' law of be prepared. Something mm -hmm. is coming. <laughs> so it was like a creating a much a higher sensitivity of awareness, if you will, mm -hmm. that what you're going through isn't just uh, necessarily going through the motions. That's when I first felt like, wow, something might happen here where you could actually serve in other than a, a normal time effort. Mm -hmm. You could feel it coming. Okay. All right. Now, while you were doing all the ROTC stuff, what was your actual academic major? Right. So, uh, chemistry. Mm -hmm. So, it was uh, basically a Bachelor of Arts. Mm -hmm. And I, I was always on the science side of the equation. Naval mm -hmm. science was there. Chemistry was there. So, um, it, it, that's where my focus was okay. on, the, on, the, on the campus. All right. Now, when you... Uh, become a naval officer then you normally have some kind of specialization or area and did you pick that or was it picked for you right so that was probably the first earmark into uh, some extensive training so i uh, graduated um, in that may 65 time frame and then went to nuclear chemical and biological warfare school i was in philadelphia very intensive in the and that when you come out, you are certified as what they call a dam damage control assistant. So it's a very, very extensive program for several months. I remember going to that in Philadelphia shipyard. So when you come out of it, you now are an ensign, but you're beginning your uh, specialization, if you will. So when you go aboard a ship, um, it isn't just uh, having an ensign degree. Um, I mean, an, an instant um, rank, yeah. but you would now, have, you could be going to things like uh, main propulsion assistant, you could go to that kind of training, and then you get into more line operation training, which I can talk about in a minute. So that was the first, I would say, and that left a lot of memories, which I still have today, because that was a ex extremely close enough program with simulated exercises that you would have a taste forever of what a, uh, a casualty situation or collateral damage might might look like. Okay. Well, what were some of the, the exercises or things that you did uh, in that first training? Mm. Um, well, two or three of them that come to light. First of all, there's a lot of fire training. So they would light fires. And uh, you would have to uh, figure a way to get them out. And so they might be class A, class B, class C fires. Uh, some of them are oil generated, some electrical generated, but uh, these were not small fires. These were large fires that you actually had to go in because ships might suffer a class Alpha Bravo or class mm -hmm. Charlie fire. So you were immersed in that. So that was the first thing is what does a 10, 15 foot flame really look like and how do you get in there to take care of that. Mm -hmm. So, and there were different techniques. 
But they also had um, an exercise of smoke training, and that is one that's extremely difficult. So you're actually in a compartment that's c totally sealed, and um, you have your what the, what is known, and I still think today they know as OBAs or oxygen breathing apparatus, mm -hmm. where you're put with a canister, and um, it's okay with your canister on, but then they rip your canister off and they ask you to get out. And there's certain things you learn about smoke, and I do remember that one completely to this day, um, of what actually trying to walk down several decks and crawling through spaces. Now, they did have people in there to take care of you if you needed it, but that was an exercise that, of how do you get out of a smoke-filled compartment. Okay. Now, did you do gas drills and things like that, too, like for tear gas or things like that? Oh, yeah. So you had a chance to um, cry some, cry none. So th this is where you are now exposed to some of this. You are also exposed to uh, learning how to give yourself shots, um, which uh, you had to have. So you were carrying these at the same time. And then um, another exercise that I do remember going through was a potential uh, drowning exercise. So they actually had a hull in there, and they would submerge it and uh, then you were placed in the middle of it and uh, had to figure out how to get out of it through compartments. Mm -hmm. Still remember that exercise to this day. All right, uh, and then what about the nuclear side of things? Were you preparing for nuclear attack or for say leaks on a ship that was nuclear powered? Or? Probably more on a biological warfare side than mm -hmm. nuclear. Okay. Nuclear was basically if you were uh, in a scenario where a nuclear attack was underway you had to wash down the ship and do some other things. So it was more of, yes, this could happen, but then you had to be self-contained. But not only that is radiation. Mm -hmm. So you were exposed to that. And yes, we did have tags and looked at what that would mean. But we also saw at that time, which today you see carried on all these years later, is biological warfare, which is still probably one, if not the most lethal ways uh, today and um, so we were given way back then um, videos of where biological warfare had actually taken place and you can't recreate those scenes but I do remember uh, looking at w how a biological warfare attack could actually take place and it was done fascinating by um, using an aircraft at very high altitudes dropping it into the airstreams and they used a particle sensitivity and then put the plates on the back of telephone poles. And so you could actually go out and figure out with one airplane dropping this and seeing where the airstreams would take it and then seeing what the concentration was on the back of plates on. Mm -hmm. So that was so many years ago. So you just see the sophistication. I can't even describe it today. but. That to me was fairly sophisticated in alerting us to the fact of this could come from a nuclear attack. It could come, we were more concerned about biological at that time because not so much to the ship, but to a country mm -hmm. like taking out feedstocks, mm -hmm. a contaminating water. And then of course the other ones were basically what you might uh, see as a casualty drill aboard a ship either from a fire mm -hmm. Uh, from uh, smoke or from water being brought on board by a compartment. So mm -hmm. you got kind of like a, a very intensified hands-on capability as you walked out of that. Right. Okay. Uh, now, was this school the only one you did before you went to your first ship, or do you have yes. something? Okay. So what's your first uh, actual assignment then? Uh, when you leave, um, I left North Carolina I actually found the document while I was getting through some of the files and you actually I wondered how I arrived there so I actually put I would like to have the opportunity to go on a Fram 2 destroyer mm -hmm. so I actually wondered myself how I wound up there but there it was <laughs> as I uh, as I left uh, Carolina there it was so that's what I went on board and that the uh, ship was uh, home ported in uh, Norfolk okay now which ship was this DD 724 USS Laffey all right. Now, uh, and do you have an idea about when that was built? 
Was that a post-World War II ship? or No, most of these ships that I was on, including the Natchez, which we'll talk about, these were older ships. So mm -hmm. they had been around and uh, it's just really good surface. So uh, destroyer, but what was interesting about this, so um, I remember leaving the school and then going, so I came aboard the Laffey in right away in like September of 65. So mm -hmm. it was right after that school, which was for the summer of 65 and there I went. Okay. So I was kind of like transported. So the ship was not home ported. Mm -hmm. It was already doing um, its, its uh, exercises in um, the Red, in the China, uh, not the, in the Indian Ocean, okay. in the Red Sea. And how did they get you out to the ship? Very interesting. So um, I was wondering the same thing. I was wondering whether I was going to pick it up in a port or whether I was, how I was going to do this. So I actually was helicoptered in. I do remember that because the seas at that time were about 15 feet. And that was a memorable opportunity to be dropped in by a helicopter on top of a uh, destroyer while you're underway doing exercise drills. So I, I, do, I do remember that. Okay. And you say, see, use 15 feet. So you have like 15 foot high waves, essentially, yeah, yeah. that you're, so the so ship is going up and down. I remember at the time um, a little bit about the exercises. So I think. At this time, um, it might have been the Roosevelt, that name comes back to me, but it was plane guarding. Mm -hmm. So one of the exercises for destroyers is, besides uh, combatant and firepower, is to plane guard. So you would be in formation with other ships and exercises, and they would be doing um, flight operations, and you'd be plane guarding so that if there was, in fact, a plane with an overboard drill or uh, a casualty, you would peel off and do um, uh, a rescue on it. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the, I, I remember one of the task force operations that was originally part of that. So it, these are usually deployments that would last for six to nine months mm -hmm. unless you were asked to uh, stay on. Okay. But I knew going in and I, is that I was one of the over complemented ensigns. So they have a certain amount of, um, of uh, deployment of, of officers and enlisted people. And I remember when I went aboard that I was on the over complement side. And I always wondered about that. Over complemented mean you were one above the number. I never really got to figure out why that happened, but I guess they anticipated either somebody leaving, um, but there was no room. So instead of joining officers' quarters, I do remember joining chief's quarters. Mm -hmm. So this was a fascinating opportunity when I first came aboard to, and that is usually not happened, so I actually had the opportunity to really see the senior enlisted side, um, which was the chiefs in this. And that was an interesting experience for me because usually everybody, you're a boot ensign, everybody wonders to know whether you're going to make it or not, mm -hmm. and you're really, really green. And I was in many, many areas, but I was blessed with the opportunity of having some really senior people there that uh, sort of began to mold and shape a little bit of that for a short period of time. So. Okay, so uh, yeah, I mean, I guess you so you arrive on, on the ship then, and you, you mention, okay, there's no room for you in the officers' quarters, so you join petty officers instead, uh, but then in general, I mean, how are you treated or what kind of reception do you get when you come onto the ship? Yeah, I remember that too. Um, it basically all now comes to fruition. All the training in the world is not going to give you this, so you're now there and have to perform. And uh, I do remember struggling. Um, seas were just really, really difficult, and you had to get your sea legs, and um, that took forever. And I remember uh, nobody really, I mean, everybody goes through it, but you, it takes weeks to get your sea legs. Mm -hmm. And so I had to go through that period, but yet also stand all the watches and do everything you're supposed to do. And I do remember those struggle days and people wondering, you know, as they look at you and they know you're struggling, you know, like, what are you going to be like in the next couple of weeks after all this sea legs mm -hmm. and you get a little bit more. So very, very um, challenging time to really sort of now all of a sudden you are who you have been trained to be, but okay. now reality sets in. Now, did anybody uh, try to help you or coach you or do they just leave you to your own devices? Um, 
couple of the junior officers were there. They and I do remember a few of them, but it's basically you're on your own. Mm -hmm. You're on your own. All right. Now, what actual duties did you have then on on the Laffey? What were you doing for them? Well, I I do remember one specific training that I um, again. Um, you would not actually take an officer of the deck, but you could become a quarter deck watch officer. So I was certified during this time frame as a quarter deck watch officer. So you would be part of uh, four on, four off, or four on, eight off, you know, whatever the exercise required, meaning four hours on and eight hours off. So you'd be continually doing this, and then you would be with the officer of the deck and a quarter deck watch officer and those requirements would be up on the bridge well, so okay so you're up on the bridge and so you're simply there but did you have any actual sightings yep okay. you've got people as lookouts on the mm -hmm. sides of the ship so that was a specific area first for officers to be acquainted mm -hmm. with what the um, bridge um, duties really really were mm -hmm. And so uh, some of those um, officers might be in supply. They would not be part of this. So now you're considered part of the line mm -hmm. duties. And so that was the first piece that I do remember going through. And then it uh, takes a while to get certified. But then you are now a quarter deck watch officer. So that for me, and you've got other officers, uh, junior ones that might be main propulsion assistants whose requirements are down inside the ship but mm -hmm. this uh they had a group of us that were um uh, now being exposed to um how ships um really maneuver what the exercises are because you can see mm -hmm. you can see what's going on okay so as far as you can tell or put together now i mean what was uh your ship ac actually doing or what was the task force you were with actually doing at that point and again, a little bit of this is foggy. I get a, a little better with the next level, but mm -hmm. um, it was because I was getting my legs and everything else, I, I was not as, what shall we say, cognizant of what these exercises were. But mm -hmm. So there were a number of ships that you were just not in, in this by your own. I do remember the carrier there. I do remember other destroyers and other ships. So you would be a lot of this information. Mm -hmm. So there are several ways that you would have a task force group operating. And so it would have a carrier and then it would have certain ships on the outside for um, one exercise I remember is what they call a bent line screen, which is where you have a carrier in the middle and you have certain ships that are on the outside in a bent line screen mm -hmm. for protection. So all these were different types of exercises in formation. And so that's what I remember the first because when I left the ship and then went into this next um, service area, that became very helpful because you think when you're just out there, you're by yourself, you're doing no, 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 no. You're given orders to do this in formation. And so you have to be, regardless of what those water conditions are, you have to be 2,000 yards directly behind at this angle. So I would watch the officers of the deck try to maneuver these ships to stay in these formations and you could see them on the radar screen. So this is like, okay, like you want to stay as tight in this type of formation. And so they would expose you to different formations to protect and to also be uh, on assault if needed. So it was several different roles, but this was part of these exercises that were coming from um, a, the fleet. Okay. Of course, a destroyer is a relatively small ship. I mean, yeah, did, did, it think, did it help you to kind of orient yourself to what the Navy does because you were on something where you could see all these different dimensions? I, I would say yes, because even though I was there for a short period of time, it gave me the opportunity to see a ship in action and all the component parts and how they all flow. And yes, they're, they're small. They're hundreds of feet. You know, they're not like 500 and above. So these are small vessels. They've, um, they can, um, you know, they... They can speed at a significant number of knots, um, and they do a lot of warfare. Mm -hmm. And so they're very electronically, um, uh, well, I, I'm thinking ahead to the type of electronics we had, but they, have a, uh, they had probably the most up-to-date fire control systems so that if you were being attacked by an aircraft, you could you could look at the fire control systems. They had five inch 38 mounts and other things. And 
So um, you had a chance to see the armament on the ship. You mm -hmm. had a chance to see what it was like to maneuver in formation. You could see all these different departments aboard a ship. You could see how the, um, the importance of the, the chiefs and the warrant officers, they're the most senior. They spent years in the service. And then you got somebody like ourselves that are here for the first time, but yet you were then assigned to different divisions and things like that. So it was the first chance to be a part of enlisted with warrant officers to see how uh, that whole division, because there were a number of divisions on a ship, would actually um, come uh, work together. So it was, yes, but it was more, I would say, for me, an opportunity to, to soak in before I actually contributed. Okay. Now, how long did you spend on the Laffey? I was there from September of uh, 65 to March of 66 with one important school that happened in between. Okay. So after moving through becoming a quarter deck watch officer, I then had the chance to go to school for officer of the deck, OOD mm -hmm. tactics. And that's now where the opportunity will be to train uh, to actually uh, take over the ship from the captain mm -hmm. um, when he is not um, uh, actually on the deck. So there are a number of, of people who are trained in it. So I went to that, and that school, uh, OOD tactics school, ended in um, December of 65. So while I was aboard the Laffey, short period, but I did get that training, mm -hmm. and as soon as I had that training, this complement of officers and shakeup sort of came, and then the question was, where do you want to go? Mm -hmm. And I didn't answer the question. I just said, I didn't look at this from a sensitivity with what was brewing in, in Asia at the time. I just said, wherever I can serve. Okay, so the idea was that this was, in a way, on the Laffey, that was just sort of a temporary assignment to kind of give you literally your sea legs. That's uh, it. And then, now where did you do the officer of the deck training? I'm trying to remember and I can't, it just doesn't come. Was it back in the U.S. or was it still with the fleet? It, it, they did these in Europe too at some mm -hmm. of the ports. I just mm -hmm. can't, it just doesn't come to me. Okay. Why this one doesn't and most of the other ones do, but... Um, it, it did, at the time, give you the fact of, wow, there's something more here coming. Mm -hmm. So now you have the DCA, the Quarter Deck Watch Officer, the OOD. So you're becoming now to have a, a set of complementary skills that can be used. I guess mm -hmm. that's the best way mm -hmm. to package in a very short time frame because now we're still only, right? We're not even a year out of mm -hmm. graduation. Right. And now all of a sudden I have this. That's what I remember is I have a package now. And then when the question is where, that's when the orders came back. You're going to go from the East Coast to the West Coast. And that's right. when the change happened. Okay. So when it's time for, now, did, while you were uh, with uh, the Laffey, do you remember if you ever went into port any place or did you stay at sea the whole time? Right. Well, it, there is an interesting note here that um, I met my wife who went to North Carolina for the same time I did, but I never met her. Mm -hmm. So I met her uh, when the Laffey was ported in Norfolk. Okay. And she uh, was from um, Virginia Beach and actually taught school there. Mm -hmm. So that was the first time that I had met her it was aboard the Laffey while we were either running in or running out for a short period of time. Okay. So the Laffey, so you went back to your home port. Right. Did you stop in any overseas ports that you can recall or just back in Norfolk? Uh, I remember one where we had a degree of difficulty entering a port and um, actually had a small um, collision. So I do remember those. and. Um, it, it's just all part of the background there, but I do remember that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it just happened and, you know, you were not, uh, shall we say, put into a scenario where you couldn't steam, you couldn't mm -hmm. do this. But I do remember the beginnings of what something might look like in terms of uh, real action. But this was not under any course. East Coast was all preparation right. training for whatever was going to take place. But when I left, um, I, I didn't know I was going to the Neches, which is mm -hmm. AO 47. 
uh, home ported in Hunter's Point, but I had to go to school again. Okay. So now we go to the next school, which is cargo fuel oil handling. So that was intensive training mm -hmm. on how you move fuel. Okay. And where did you do this? Uh, that was in San Diego. Okay. So ship was in Hunter's Point of San Francisco, but I do remember going. And so I went to that cargo fuel oil handling or petroleum school uh, for several months um, in the spring of 1966. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what did that school consist of? Well, <coughs> coupled with, you can see now the background with a chemical and biological mm -hmm. warfare, mm -hmm. you're sitting on something that could explode easily. So um, you have to learn the types of fuel. So there's JP5, JP4, which are basically aviation fuels. Most of it is bunker fuel or what the, the ships use. And uh, you were exposed to all of that. You were exposed to how to keep that fuel clean. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize the importance of that. I can share a story in a minute about that. So you're exposed, again, to salt water, right? So you can think where sediment, salt water, gets involved in these fuels. So you got to know how to, what they are, and then you have to know how to handle them. And that means pumping. Mm -hmm. So all these fuels that we're describing are on the oiler and are pumped to various ships as they come alongside. So I'd never, uh, never been a part of that mm -hmm. and seeing that operation, but then you have to realize you have to know flammability, you have to know safety, you have to know how to keep it on spec, and you have to know how to move it, and then you also have to know the crew that you're going to be with as part of the deckhands to move that fuel. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot, but came out of school and that's now what I came aboard as. They had to have one of those aboard this ship. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was trained. Now, all of a sudden, I'm not looking at anybody else. I'm looking at myself mm -hmm. because now I have that training that that ship required. All right. So when you were doing the school, would they take you out to sea to practice refueling and things like that? Or did you stay in the harbor? Or? Yeah, it's probably in the, in the harbor, but they did give you, they have so many videos now that they would use in class mm -hmm. to show. And, you know, I showed you one yeah. recently of what uh, was taken of the Netches. It's mm -hmm. now been decommissioned and put to bed, but you could get these. So uh, there was a lot of these classes were done with videos. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the things that I do remember from that um, is, to, is that the ship I was going to go aboard all these valves had to be cranked by hand. It, the Netches is one of the oldest but most reliable oilers that the fleet had. A lot of them now move into hydraulics and you just sit on a, and just move them. No, mm -hmm. these had to be moved by hand. So I remember asking myself, holy cow, am I going to remember to turn the right valves on <laughs> and the right valves off? That's all I remember out of that one. But I do remember that question living with me like, my goodness gracious. And then to do it in seas and all that sort of stuff, it's like, wow. And I do remember the underway replenishment with the Laffey, you know, doing a few of these, but mm -hmm. never from the supply side. Most of the time, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't appreciate other than the lines come over, you take your fuel and you leave. Now all of a sudden I'm looking at it through a different lens. It's like what's all the preparation that has to go on before that ship comes alongside. And they could come along both sides at the same time. Mm -hmm. So all of this is like I have no idea what I'm going to experience. But that's what, you know, it was more and you can see these by the, some of the, the videos that they were shooting in some of the sequences. So you could see those operations coming full circle pretty quick. Okay. Now where and when do you join the Netches? Uh, I joined it in San Francisco in that spring right away. So mm -hmm. it was that March time frame yeah. um, that I went to school. Mm -hmm. So I went to school right there and came right back mm -hmm. and, and it was deployed. Okay.
Uh, so then you sailed with it out from San Francisco. Right. Okay. Uh, and where were you going? We were going to what they call the South China Sea, Gulf mm -hmm. of Tonkin, Yankee mm -hmm. Station. So right. all that are familiar terms to many, unfamiliar to me at the time, but we knew what we were going to do. So uh, we were, of course, all 7th Fleet operations, which were uh, designated into the South China Sea. Our home port was Subic Bay. Very interesting home port. Okay. And just to add to that, we were part of what they call a task force. So you have the Seventh Fleet, but then they have different task forces underneath it. So this task force was with underway replenishment groups. So we were an oiler, but you also need to have AEs, which are ammunition ships. And you have to have supply ships. So they were out there too. But we were then, where do we get our fuel? And that was from Subic Bay. Mm -hmm. So that was a steaming couple of days from uh, Subic Bay in the Philippines out into the South China Sea. So that was what was what ahead of us. <coughs> okay. Now, you, um, when you went out the first time, did you stop off in Subic Bay first and then go on? Take on fuel. Okay. Uh, and uh, describe a little bit the uh, setup at Subic Bay or what was there, what went on there. Probably the most... Uh, the biggest experience I could ever have in this in this new role. So here I am, first cargo officer and a young ensign coming aboard to take on this fuel. So we go into Subic Bay and you take yourself down to where the depot is, the fuel depot, and you send your lines across and you start taking on fuel. And I start taking on fuel, and I'm, we have a small lab, very unsophisticated at the time. Uh, but to take on bunker fuel, you basically look for sediment. So this fuel starts coming on board, and these are very deep tanks, mm -hmm. you know, 30-foot tanks. And we've got, oh boy, you have several mains. Ones didn't have, they were just basically at the bow of the ship, so you had two up there, and then you started with... Um, and that was in number one. And then number two through number, I think, uh, eight or nine all had uh, center tanks and two wing tanks. So we started taking on this fuel. And I started noticing, because you'd spin these in centrifuges. I was picking up rust. So I didn't think too much about it. I said, well, maybe it'll percolate through. It didn't percolate through. So I took this up to the captain who had never seen a captain. I just want to let you know something. This is what your fuel looks like. He couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And we shut it down. Mm -hmm. And we pumped it back. All I was doing was what that school had just told me to right. do. And I always wondered why. So I got into a little bit of, well, they're going to test these young ensigns. Mm -hmm. This is real time. So here, you know, thinks everything's hunky-dory and you're over there, and no, it wasn't hunky-dory at all. So the first fuel that I took on board, mm -hmm. we were able to catch. And that experience, every time I came back in, I got the best treatment in the world. So I, to this day, don't know whether they were testing myself and the captain, or mm -hmm. whether the captain was aware and we're just going to go do this, but that's the liveest training you could ever imagine. Okay. Now, I would, you're making it basically sound as if you were sort of the one officer on that ship whose job was to do this. Is we that, had a chief it? and we had a crew. Okay. So the chief was there, of course, with right. me, but we were starting to catch this and wondered. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just me catching it, but it was our responsibility right. to take that fuel on. So when everybody would go uh, on leave or, mm -hmm. you know, go off ship for a while, no. So I'd stay on the ship almost all the time because you're taking back on fuel. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get a whole lot of time right. on on the, in Subic Bay because we we're always when we came in just very very impactful taking mm -hmm. on fuel. But it it certainly with this 
group of, of, and really the warrant officer and myself, looking at this fuel and saying, hey, this is not uh, acceptable okay. fuel to take. But I guess part of what I was asking about was that you don't have, there are not other officers on this ship with the same mm -mm. responsibility that you rotate no. with. So it really is just you, and you're just a new guy coming on there, and okay, that's yeah. your job. Yeah. All right. But in the meantime, you, you, you don't get to, say, enjoy as much of Sydney oh, Bay no, no, no. as so most of the others So that was the first do. time. So you have to load up because you're using yep. fuel to get across, the steam across mm -hmm. the Pacific, and you get a chance. And um, I have in the book here that was for this tour, mm -hmm. you can see actually where the ship went. Um, but you're, you now know the routine. Well, I didn't know the routine yet. Mm -hmm. I just knew... When we were out of fuel and supplies, we had to go back into Subic Bay. Right. So that's where you were going to get the supplies. Then you had to steam for a few days mm -hmm. out into this 700, 900 mile big sea to get you to your station. So I hadn't done that yet mm -hmm. because we had to take on the fuel right, and all right. the supplies. So I had not yet gone underway with mm -hmm. any underway replenishments to know what that was like. Mm -hmm. But I just now knew that, okay, this is going to be the routine for taking on right. fuel. Okay. So you've done that. And so now you, you, you head out to South China Sea. Explain a little bit for an outside audience uh, what Yankee Station was. Yankee Station was an area in the Gulf of Tonkin in the China Sea, South China Sea, so they actually had two stations. They had um, totally unfamiliar with what they called Dixie Station, which was in the South China Sea. So this is in the mm -hmm. north part. Mm -hmm. So this, um, and I presume, and I, I, I did a little bit more researching, is that they would have several groups of, uh, you needed to have two or three carriers at all times. So that would, there would be two or three carriers in this area and our primary job was to refuel usually at night mm -hmm. so most of these operations were done at night some were done during the day but that was to primarily um, keep as much of the carrier uh, formations now we are further enough away except for one time <laughs> uh, being fired upon so usually you're far enough away until storms etc get you mm -hmm. in close and i do remember that one time but these carriers are the ones that were providing uh the, f the, f the flights mm -hmm. and that's where they would go in the navy would go in with the aircraft so we were carrying jp5 which is primarily kerosene so besides sediment and bunker fuel the other big problem is salt water in kerosene so you had to test all the times, and mm -hmm. you couldn't leave the vents open because lots of times you would want to. You could only open those vents when there was no rain, when the seas were not coming over the, the forecastle. You know, mm -hmm. you, you had to watch what you were doing. So you're always there wanting to make sure that you wouldn't have built up flame vapors in these, mm -hmm. but you also wouldn't have them during the seas. So you, that's where your, your deckhands would be out there ensuring at all times mm -hmm. that you had the right ventilation systems and right. So this Yankee station was a area that we were a task force as part of the seven fleet operations, mm -hmm. but we could not give any orders. Right. So we're subject to those that are in the seventh fleet that would then start to say, okay, carriers X, Y, and Z, there need to be refueled. You've got destroyers, you've got uh, the Canberra. I remember a few of the larger surface vessels being in there. And I think, my memory, I did a little bit of more research. There were about 40 Navy craft during this time frame that were either in the um, uh, Yankee Station or Dixie Station, because mm -hmm. each of those would have two or three carriers, numbered destroyers. But I was exposed to some ships while we were there that mm -hmm. we can get into that I've never ever seen before and um, because they're the smaller ones. Right. So we arrived in this Yankee station as part of a task force. Mm -hmm. And then we would be called into formation by the superior officer who is in charge of those operations, which weren't us. Okay. So big picture. The carriers are there providing basically... Uh, support for troops on the ground or striking mm -hmm. targets in North Vietnam, but basically the aircraft are conducting military operations 
and that's it. And then you're you're basically there to keep everybody fueled. Right. There were some other ships in here, and I can't tell you. Um, you know, there were some guided missiles, mm -hmm. and I can't. Um, I can talk about a little bit of a couple of ships that I had never ever seen before that we actually were able to refuel, mm -hmm. um, that were actually providing a lot of that firepower. Mm -hmm. But this, um, again, you had to do, now let's go back to the Laffey, right? Yep. So you had the destroyers in there and they're doing the same things now, but now we're actually in war. Mm -hmm. So that training from the Netch uh, f that I had on the Netch is going back to the Laffey, I now saw both sides of the equation. Right. So they may be firing at, at certain times. They would go in closer mm -hmm. and maybe provide firepower into the coastline, and then the, sh the, uh, the air uh, wings would take off and go in and provide additional uh, strafing runs into mm -hmm. the country. Uh, but I could see that, but I can't speak to what actual sure. firepower destroyers were giving, right. but they would be doing that. Right, yeah, okay. Uh, so A cruiser now and then, mm -hmm. the big boys yeah. were around, not many of them. So you would have that, and then you would have other. So there are amphib vessels. I mean, the number of, uh, you've got cruisers, you've got destroyers, you've got amphibs, you've got carriers, you've got mine sweeps, and you've got river forces. So you could probably break down at least seven to 10 task force groups. So if mm -hmm. you can imagine the war now having Seventh Fleet operations, but eight to ten task forces, and how do they all come together? That's right. like, I never appreciated that, actually, until you asked me to go back and mm -hmm. do a little research. And when, when I saw it, it was like, how and where did those plans come from? Mm -hmm. And we would sometimes ask those same questions. Okay. So now from your perspective on board the ship, uh, if you have to refuel, say, uh, an aircraft carrier, how do you do that, and what's your job? Oh. So there were a few that uh, were pretty special in this. So I listed some mm -hmm. of the carriers that we actually, uh, I think the, uh, the ones that I remember, there were two or three that I remember specifically. I do remember the Kitty Hawk. That was uh, CV-63. That was one of the first carriers brought into Yankee Station. Mm -hmm. Another big one, number two in this, I think, was the Ticonderoga. These were the first response. Uh, this was, uh, I think, uh, CB-11. So that was an Essex class. The Kitty Hawk was a Kitty Hawk class. And then the third one, which was the only one we ever saw, was the Enterprise class, which was the USS Enterprise. And um, nuclear, mm -hmm. only one. I do remember that coming alongside. And here we are at a 500-foot oiler steaming along, and you had to be given orders on um, the speed, mm -hmm. wind direction, because don't forget, at any one time, they might be flying. So this was not, let's pick the smoothest. No, you had to pick, get a certain amount of headwind off the front of that aircraft carrier so they could launch planes. You'd probably be doing this in the night. Mm -hmm. And then, all of a sudden, how does a USS Enterprise come alongside close. I was so impressed with the ship handling of these carriers. So if you can picture, our operations were on the deck, okay? So you've got up in the front, you've got the bow and you've got where the conning tower is for the oiler and you've got the bridge and all of that and communications and so that sits up front then you go back and you got all this massive amount of tankage mm -hmm. and then you've got the stern so we're right in the middle on the deck when mm -hmm. this so they have the ability to steam in so you'd be steaming you had to steam in probably a minimum of 12 knots but it wouldn't take them forever to, they were not steaming at 13. You would take hours to catch mm -hmm. up. They'd be steaming at 25 and know when to shut down. Just go in the neutral and then go in reverse and slow those engines down. It was the most impressive. And then you would look out. One deck, two decks, three decks, four decks, five decks, six decks, seven decks. Then you realized, even though you thought you were on a big ship, my goodness gracious, that was the Enterprise. And so the operations for the carriers, 
always concern me because you've got a lot of water that's bouncing off that hull and that would all wash back on us so we always practice uh, man overboard drills because you were besides the fact with a life preserver and everything else getting getting a chance to get washed overboard was pretty easy mm -hmm. so there was uh, a, dam a damage control and um, really where all the operations were so you could get inside on the deck in the area where you could have some safety but for the most part you're going around turning valves right so the interesting piece in doing that is that wasn't the first ship that was towards the end mm -hmm. but you then had to figure out all of this how do you get these hoses over to the other side and they would always take their fuel um, basically in the f uh, in in the f for the ship and the after the ship so it wasn't just one mm -hmm. So you have to send several lines aboard, and then you have to look at, are you taking av gas in addition to JP-5? So ships like the Kitty Hawk would take bunker fuel to run on, then they want their av gas, and then you'd have to make sure, again, all those samples of all those fuels are right. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have to send over, and so we'd shoot lines over, so that was it, with a um, basically a uh, rubberized, um, kind of like arrow mm -hmm. and it would go over and we'd shoot these and we'd and there would be a line attached and so then the line would come across and you'd have to have uh, on both sides now the ability to put up a, a fuel line and mm -hmm. run it across but so this was all like can you hit the mark in the middle of the night and do all this stuff and you get so we had guys that were really deck hands that were really good they loved that they mm -hmm. loved the ability to go shoot at one of these big carriers and so we tried to lighten it up but it, it you could see the seriousness of all of this so that that sort of said okay but then we also would take on destroyers mm -hmm. so to the port side we'd go one to the starboard side the dual operations were extremely difficult because now you've got four lines out mm -hmm. the most difficult thing is the pressure and uh, these things are stoked with a lot of pressure. And if they're not clamped on right, whew, mm -hmm. you're going to paint somebody black. And that, that, that happened um, not so much with us, but you, you'll see pictures of uh, ships that were basically had a, a good dose of bunker fuel. So that's mm -hmm. one of the issues. So yeah, they maintained big pressure hoses. And then once that fuel was aboard, you had to drain them right and then bring them back right and not drop a whole lot of this stuff into mm -hmm. the into the water or on the board or side of ships and and make it as clean an operation so for me the first couple of times was like just watching it happen mm -hmm. and thank goodness we had a great chief and great deckhands because they'd done it before right i hadn't done any of this before yeah. so, so i got better as the replenishments went underway okay now did you do any of the hands-on stuff yourself and would you get down and, and use the valves at all or do what they were doing or i would uh oh, oh for sure because you always wanted to participate right. but i didn't want to take over somebody yeah. else's response yeah. so my job is i would always work with the chief and i do remember that with a sheet of paper to trace the lines mm -hmm. because I just mentioned we have all these tanks mm -hmm. like well which one's being drained at what time yeah. so I would kind of do a chalkboard thing and then walk around to make sure on the deck regardless of the conditions but to walk around to make sure we're actually pumping from that mm -hmm. and the pressure's right so I was always there to sort of trace and then the question is what happens when one tank is empty mm -hmm. and then you have to shift to another tank so just to give people perspective these ships when loaded with fuel so they would hold the Laffey which I mean the Netches by the way is the most decorated fleet tanker in US Navy history it is commissioned in 1942 and uh, went to rest on 1970 so most decorated fleet. I did not know that at when until I did some research but it contained um, the following characteristics. So it was, just so I get all of the size and length and everything mm. correctly here. So it was what they call um, a Mattaponi class oiler. There were several classes of oilers, like classes of aircraft carriers. Um, named for the Natchez River in Texas. 242 officers and enlisted, so it had a fairly large complement. Mm. Uh, displacement 22,445 tons so it uh, 
It's a fairly significant size ship, 520 feet in length. Uh, still small compared to a carrier, mm -hmm. but larger than most of the other destroyers and other everything else. Beam uh, 68 feet, flank speed uh, 16 knots. Now, one of the re reasons for reliability, single screw, but a sitting duck, mm -hmm. but the most reliable you'd ever see. And that's why this was um, probably weathered so many different uh, campaigns for the Navy. I do remember that. Mm -hmm. Maneuverability, we did all kinds of man overboard drills and competed with one or another on the deck and tried to do different formations. But the disposition um, was, uh, final dis disis uh, disposition was uh, sold for scrapping in December of 73. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it took on a lot of fuel, so it would be over 35 feet in draft, fully loaded. Mm -hmm. When all the fuel was gone, which is we would offload all that fuel, you just come up like a floating top. Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden you're riding 8, 10 feet versus over 30. Very interesting, right? So yeah. you get a chance to ride in many different feelings and perspectives. So we would stay out for every time for probably 30 plus days. Mm -hmm. And in that time frame, we would do... Um, over 30 days, we would do, on average, probably 30 to 35 uh, replenishments. Okay. And then we're empty and then back to okay. operation. Now, while you're out uh, on duty here, did you have to ride through any typhoons or bad storms? Yeah. Uh, I remember some well over 20, 25 feet, uh, which today is, you know, if you go watch some of these fishing mm -hmm. Uh, that's nothing today, but uh, it is when you're doing replenishments and um, being told what formations and being told. So uh, when we weren't doing that during the day, you would get replenishments as well. Mm -hmm. So those are for the major ships, but as time passed, because we did this month after month after month, uh, and then going back to Subic Bay, um, we'd be called out even though it would take you go back in after 30 days for probably one to two so that's why my time was limited mm -hmm. so while well, they all get a good meal and every once in a while i could sn sneak off the officers quarters and do but uh subic bay was a was a tough area so even though you look at it as user friendly it was it was a very difficult time and uh that was memorable as as well as some of the impressions that I was giving. But uh, the, the Filipinos in the Navy were just great because a lot of those were stewards on board. Mm -hmm. from the, so uh, I remember being taught how to eat gilly gilly, and, which is interesting pieces of rice and fish mm -hmm. and meat. So uh, it was the culture side of this started to, because all of a sudden, you know, you got all different people with all different backgrounds, mm -hmm. all in this thing, not quite sure why we're here, what we're doing. But the routine sort of helped. Mm -hmm. So for me, okay, we're done. Now we go back. But every once in a while, we would call back before that two days of, all right, we'll let the first part of the crew off for one night, mm -hmm. let another off, we'll let some off for two nights. We'd get, we'd get called back out because of the need. So we were prime time for this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at least in the northern part. Right. And then we had a chance to even go in further as the months progressed. But that became a routine that was helpful to me. So okay. if we could perfect that routine, which had its degrees of difficulty, um, I don't ever remember exactly how many, but for the months we were out there, you can start adding them up and start looking at the types of uh, vessels, and then you realize how much fuel we actually you know, were able to offload. Okay. So what basically were the dates of your service on the Natchez? So I came aboard in um, this April, um, March, April of 66, mm -hmm. and their tour came back in, um, actually released in 19, in June of 67. Okay. Now, over the course of that time, does most of the, the, the crew and ship's complement remain the same? Or do they, okay, so it's not like the Army where everybody is going in and out on their own one-year calendars and cycles and stuff. Is it, is it? So you have pretty much the same group of people right. that you're working with the whole time. So I did um, receive a promotion 
spot promotion when I was there. So I became in December of 66, while there, mm -hmm. I became a Lieutenant JG. So I moved from Ensign mm -hmm. to Lieutenant right. JG. Okay. Uh, what impression did you have um, of the other officers, the captain or the ones that you actually worked with? Some I remember very closely um, because I worked with them. Mm -hmm. Others, um, like on the supply, we had uh, people that would handle um, that side. Mm -hmm. um, wasn't quite as close with, but you had a close knit because besides refueling, I also stood in uh, as officer of the deck. Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden, not only am I doing the cargo, but I'm also now, when the replenishments would come, I would come off the deck, right? And somebody, an officer, would come up. But I do remember um, those days very well mm -hmm. from ship handling as well. So, it, from quarter deck, then going through the officer of the deck, then to cargo fuel school. Now I also was an officer of right. the deck. Okay. So actually, then that's a almost like a job in itself mm -hmm. because you would be on for. Uh, four hours at a time and then off depending upon what but sleep you had to have a routine because you were it, just picture you were up early in the morning staying mm -hmm. your duty and oh by the way that night we're doing underway replenishments for most of the night mm -hmm. so a little sleep deprivation every once in a while but you just learn to live through it we were all young back then mm -hmm. so yep. don't worry about stuff like that but I do remember juxtapositioning mm -hmm. both those two dishes. Sure. Okay. Uh, what was the captain like? Captain Millar. So, uh, great guy. Um, most oilers um, take on four, what they call four stripers as full captains. Mm -hmm. And so they rotate. So he had both line duty, he both le also had uh, shore duty, and uh, he was very well experienced. So, mm -hmm. uh, he set the very right temperament, and I, I can't, we should talk about temperament a lot. Um, it's very difficult when you're in 90 plus degrees and 90% humidity every day to look your best. Mm -hmm. But you also don't want to look like you didn't care to be in the Navy. So it was this balance, and he set a very good one. Mm -hmm. So. Um, he also was very congenial. I do remember him as um, expecting if he gave an order for you to carry it out, but he wasn't micromanaging you, mm -hmm. which in this case, absolutely you don't want. Right. Micromanaging this kind of operations, it's the reliance on how everyone fits together. Um, he did, I remember, put us through some good challenging drills together, and uh, um, those were good. There were a couple of ship handlers that definitely among, there was a crew of us that could do many of this because you have an executive officer mm -hmm. and an administrative officer and so mm -hmm. you've got a number of those that are very well experienced and a crew of Lieutenant JGs and Lieutenants that have, because don't forget you've got armor mitt, mm -hmm. you know, you've got people who have all this, this capability too. But the ship handlers were good. I grew into being a better one. Mm -hmm. I wasn't terribly good because, question, you drop, we drop these big, nothing more than wooden crates over the side, and that would be all hands on deck, man overboard. Mm -hmm. And you would be challenged to be the first one in the shortest time frame to turn the ship around and bring it alongside. Mm -hmm. Number of ways to do that. And that was the competition. And I do remember that. Mm -hmm. I do remember not coming in first. I remember not coming in last. But I learned a lot from those mm -hmm. types of like, okay, we'll have all the OODs up on the deck here. And um, you would assume those, so um, it, you just don't walk up. So every watch, you go up to be relieved. So there was a time frame when you got 15 minutes before the watch actually happened where they would tell you sea conditions, um, anything that's happening in formation, what to expect in the next 24 hours all the sensitive radar that you would get that total picture. So you just don't walk up and take over. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have to salute and say, I assume the deck. And then the question is, you could assume the deck and the con, which is the conning tower too. So there's two pieces to that. And then if you are assuming the deck and the con, the, the person that you have to, and there are a certain set of orders that the captain knows before he goes to take rest, that if you, uh, 
alleviate any of that or change any of that, you have to call him for that change. And I remember doing that a few times, but you would want that captain to try to get as much rest as possible because now it isn't just me. Think about all the other operations mm -hmm. that he has to be sensitive for too. So, uh, but we had some very, very good times on board. Um, we had to spend Christmas at sea and shuttle Christmas trees and take back brass and take mail out and shuttle people around. So it was a pretty lively time um, to do a lot of different things. Now, did um, the routine kind of wear on people after a while? I mean, if you get to the end of that 30 days, is everyone kind of getting crazy or? Yeah. Well, not for the first time, not for the second time, but if you keep doing these month mm -hmm. after month. Yeah. And so um, we actually had to go down for a little bit because uh, some of the gun mounts, so we had to le actually go back in Japan for a very short period mm -hmm. of time uh, to get uh, some um, uh, work done. So that's all scheduled and then you get, so it, uh, it, it no question it's wearing. Um, mm -hmm. Most of those people, now again, the Netches had more than one deployment. So I was not part of the other mm -hmm. deployment. So, if you were aboard that ship and doing deployments one, two, and three, yeah, you could see that. Mm -hmm. So there was a homesickness that started for some of those sailors that had been on not one, not two, but maybe additional tours of duty because mm -hmm. they continued. It had a few more years left after, but I was in, this was phase two of the conflict. So mm -hmm. there was a discrete number of operations that they were held, but mm -hmm. they I think I looked on, and they were part of several of these. So that's where the homesickness came. Um, tired, physical tiredness, mm -hmm. yes. Water hydration, oh, water was almost a premium as well as fuel, now fresh did you, water. Did you have any kind of desalination equipment on the ship? Could you process seawater, or did you just have to fill up at Subic Bay? Okay. So did you have to take showers in salt water or things like that on those ships? Uh, no, but I remember having to talk about putting a ship on water rations, and one of them was for a period of time when we actually were moving Christmas trees around. Whoever gave that order, we thought, you know, if you're going to do into some of these, and that gets into some of these other ships that mm -hmm. um, I can describe a few of them that uh, couldn't come out all the way into formation because they were um, craft that were um, smaller like minesweeps. Mm -hmm. So minesweeps you're not going to pull off of the coastline. So we actually mm -hmm. had to get in and the hospital ships, they were in so we actually had to figure out how to maneuver in and provide support. And mm -hmm. then we had uh, uh, a few very unique uh, ships, one of which I don't think I ever saw again, but um, they call them LSMRs, landing ship missile rockets, mm -hmm. which looked like a cutoff destroyer. And they would come out, and it um, you would never see those. They were always undercover, always in, in inside in the mm -hmm. Delta, and mm -hmm. they took on much less draft. So you get a chance to see the full Navy here of experience. So physical fatigue with hydration, heat, and humidity, that that is what t took a big count. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, you mentioned at one point that when you would go inshore, there was at least one occasion w when you got fired upon? Right. And um, actually, yes. Um, and I remember it was terrible storms, and we were going up and down the coast a little close, and um, it fired across the bow. They knew who we were, so they just decided to give us a little warning. And that, uh, they, they knew. So it was like, don't come any closer, mm -hmm. you, you, you've, right. And again, when you're on these lines and you're in these stations and it's difficult with weather and rain and clouds would, would definitely affect some of the radar. So you knew you were in there and you would be up near Hanoi or something like that and it's like, but how close are we really mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So sometimes, but that's, that's the only time I do remember but um, it's interesting to talk about that for a minute. Um, we did a number of, of exercises with our fire control. So they would take, just to see if anybody actually did fire. So these were five inch 38s, but never had the right fire control system. So I do remember a couple of times when 
they would fire, uh, put a sortie in over the low course of the water and see if you could pick it up on radar and track it. And at times that aircraft was behind us before that 5 inch 38 would ever track, which mm -hmm. tells you that if anybody had really decided you could take, because the systems were, were so old mm -hmm. that they'd never had put in the new, because basically it's Korean and World War II equipment that's right. being used. And you've got an oiler, which is not primarily a combat ship. You've got some essentially had aircraft guns on there, but you're not really supposed to be doing a lot of fighting. And so they don't have the same kind of equipment they're going to have on a destroyer or something like that. But from a damage control standpoint, you always wanted to know what you could provide. Yeah. And that always left me like, oh, like mm -hmm. that's probably you're not going to be able to do very much. And so that, understand not the role, but you have to have something if somebody came out mm -hmm. from um, the coastline at any point in time, so of a smaller vessel. Because most of the vessels that were there, um, a lot of fishing vessels, and mm -hmm. they'd always play games with us in the middle of the night and um, try to look like we were running them over. They thought that if they could, you could see them with their lights on, there'd be these small fishing fleets and they'd come out. They'd try to run across the bow of the ship as close as they could. And it was always like, I presume we're not hitting any one of these. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they would do that, they thought the fishing would be better if they could get as close to that. So they, there was a whole lot of different things. So I could see these and it like, nothing you could do about them. Mm -hmm. So there was always this in the night kind of life that's going on out there. And like, who are they? What are they doing? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, it's the fishing fleets. And they'd come out, and you, you would see these. So they would, uh, th that's how close to shore some of the exercises were. Okay. Now, did you go into any ports other than Subic Bay? Right. Uh, da Nang had a port in there, and mm -hmm. yeah, there were hospital ships. So that's the first time. And again, it's very difficult to get in maneuver in these, but uh, hospital ships would be stationed in there because mm -hmm. that's where they would take uh, the people that had uh, right. suffered significant injury. Mm -hmm. So. That would be the only one where I would say we probably made the foremost entry point. Mm -hmm. And the other ones we would get as close to shore as we could. And then the mine sweeps would come out and the others. Mm -hmm. And we had smaller uh, replenishment gear we, c we could actually use for mm -hmm. them. But you're not going ashore yourself in these places. Uh -uh. Okay. Now you mentioned going to Japan. Did you get to go ashore there? I did. Um, again, a memorable experience. Um, we were there for a short period of time, and <clears throat> they always wanted um, officers that would be willing to be part of the military police. So I got a chance to be military police. That was another set of experiences that, uh, because at that time, you can imagine, uh, people had a memory of American ships. Mm -hmm. So you had, uh, at that time, you had um, Yokosuka, Yokohama, and those were a lot of where the U.S. had significant bases that could do repairs. Mm -hmm. uh, you also had a um, population that wasn't terribly excited to see U.S. Navy. Mm -hmm. So military police had the opportunity to get in and see some of the evening mm -hmm altercations and there were several so I do remember those now at this point was there sort of like sort of anti-war activism in Japan or just more general hostilities between sailors and locals a lot of people talk about Japan as being a relatively welcoming place or one where they behave pretty well it um, was it it to be very honest I it was light in terms of the the protesting mm -hmm. Um, it was more of, I would say, our stirring up mm -hmm. the locals than it was the locals stirring us up. There okay. was some of that, uh, but you could, you could deal with this. It was really our behavior, and again, mm -hmm. you're dealing now with, and it wasn't just us, because you had other ships underneath repair there, mm -hmm. too. Um, I do remember taking one tour uh, to see Hiroshima, mm -hmm. and it left a very uh, vivid impression on me uh, because the person giving me was the tour was an individual who had lost his family. Mm -hmm. 
I never forget that. Mm -hmm. And um, I have some pictures where you would look at it and it was starting to be rebuilt for sure, but you could see where that land looked a whole lot different than the countryside around mm -hmm. it. So you know exactly the containment area yeah. for where that bomb took place. But mm -hmm. then to have somebody who'd actually lost his family and he felt to honor his family mm -hmm. would be to describe what he went through and what took place. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, that left a mark with me. Okay. Uh, a lot of Navy ships uh, went down to Hong Kong at one point or other. Did yeah. you get down there? Yep. And that actually, um, just stepping through all that, that's where that military police, so you get to Hong Kong to get settled and then you get into, so yeah, not much time there, but the military police side of that is, and that's when you would see yourself as part of the police, but you would be part of the Hong Kong military police. And let me tell you, they were no nonsense. Mm -hmm. with our guys and uh, they were small but uh, extremely combative and um, once in action oh my goodness gracious so they were probably for their size the best hand-to-hand -hand trained combat people I had ever seen in my life mm -hmm. with those so it was a side of the equation that I had no appreciation of until we're there for a short period of time mm -hmm. and you're letting those people go off board how they're going to behave and everything else mm -hmm. and so staying aboard to make sure all the work on the ship gets done very, very quickly so you can go back out online. Mm -hmm. But um, I think we could have done some things differently to present ourselves in a slightly better way, okay. is my opinion. So you're kind of un unleashing soon-to-be-drunken sailors on the town and mm. someone cleans up after them. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, now, in, you spent some time kind of sorting through the things that happened while you were on the ship. Are there other kind of key events or incidents or impressions here that mm. you want to bring into the story? Right. So one of the appreciations, there's two couple things. Um, <clears throat> let me go to the, the tougher ones first. Okay. So the tougher ones would be you'd be sailing along on ranger station during the day and you'd start seeing pieces of gear in order and then you'd realize that these were these were ours where are they coming from mm -hmm. and when you first see them you're not quite sure and then you realize they're parts of aircraft and a lot of them turn out but not all the time to be um, fuel tanks so those fighter jets that left those carriers would go out and provide firepower to wherever they're asked or reconnaissance missions or whatever or helicopter or whatever but they had a certain amount of fuel inside those tanks and sometimes as you know we had no idea where some of those I just watched the recent viewing of the National Memorial Day and they had a family from Vietnam who'd lost a dad who went through all this mm -hmm. and I watched it. And it is so true that people were supposed to be at certain areas but you weren't sure where the area was and they were then captured and some came back, some didn't, some died. And then you realize that the support for these people became absolutely tantamount to what you're doing. So it goes beyond fuel. So one of the biggest things we used to do is carry mail. Mm -hmm. So mail would go in there, and that was just terrific, specifically for the small ships. And mm -hmm. then at one point, we were just given a few Christmas trees to take to these ships that were actually in there, in the Delta, mm -hmm. you know, down at these, these different coastline areas. And they would come out, and they were just so appreciative because they were the ones that were providing all that firepower, mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. all that sweeping. And they were the ones that were really the ones under the most difficult scenarios because they would take firepower from the coastline. We were mm -hmm. not taking the firepower from the coastline. So the only things we saw coming back were the planes. And uh, we, there were several uh, carriers that uh, experienced some significant issues. 44 died on the USS Oriskany, and that was um, uh, not due to um, anything from the, but this was due to a problem aboard the carrier when they mm -hmm. were launching. And so you would see that death didn't occur necessarily all by enemy fire. Mm -hmm. And so we saw more of the ones that uh, 
where this sort of came to light. Part of which is we saw a few planes not be able to get back. Mm -hmm. So they were, uh, and they were so close, and you'd be praying for them that they'd make it back on top of that carrier, and they just didn't. Mm -hmm. and we saw a few, but that sort of brought all this to light. Like, what are we doing out here? And then you see, that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And then you just pray to God that that pilot would be able to make it back. Most did, uh, but a few didn't, mm -hmm. and some were, um, you were able to get, and some mm -hmm. you weren't, because you just don't know whether they were you know, wounded as well as mm -hmm. they tried to bring them back. So that was the vividness, I guess, to us of how we saw that, coupled with those ships that we would provide. Uh, we used to take spent casings back. So we'd do just about anything anybody mm -hmm. asked us to. Mm -hmm. That was Captain Millar's, even though it's like, well, isn't the ammunition ship so as to bring back the brass? Yeah, but when's that next one coming through? And I'm mm -hmm. fully loaded with 38 shells, so. I, um, I remember when I left that that was probably, so I made a lamp out of mine. So I took <laughs> one piece of brass back, I made a lamp out of it, and I still have it today because that 5-inch 38 was it. I mean, that's so, when you take it back, that was the brass. Mm -hmm. And so you'd, you'd see how important that, that one piece of armament really was to everybody. But he was willing to be supportive, and I think that's another thing. It's like we were supposed to do this, but we could do that. Mm -hmm. Well, where in the regulations does it say that an oiler can't take on a Christmas tree or deliver mail mm -hmm. or take people, even though it might be a responsibility? So when you're in times of conflict, you really sort of do what's needed. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a full perspective. So you're out there, and you can see how the war really resides with those that are the pilots, and then in closer, you would get mine sweeps and and some of the some of the other ships. This LSMR, which I still remember today, is like um, I remember. It's probably the if you look at some of the Vietnam movies, it's the closest thing to looking at the bridge on mm -hmm. one of these and seeing people in cut off T-shirts and armament like yep. this and. Mm -hmm gun mounts where they shouldn't be, but that's what they did. Mm -hmm. And I, I just said, boy, that's the closest thing that I can ever see. And those were depicted, but we didn't have very many of those. Mm -hmm. And so the front end of this was just rockets. Yep. And I'd never seen one of those before. Mm -hmm. And you could see just by how many rounds of fire they could put off so quickly. And uh, they needed a paint job, but um, that was war. Mm -hmm. and they could really provide great firepower. So you just never know the full complement of everybody is out there. You had your job to do, but you certainly uh, had a chance to see um, casualties. Um, you had a chance to see death, mm -hmm. and, um, but yet you also had a chance to see um, how everything fits together when a conflict like this takes place. Okay. I do have some, um, so that's that. I, I do have some even more difficult memories a little further down in the story. But that, that sort of gets us through where we are. So we were, um, after we did this month after month after mm -hmm. month, and we had our ups and downs, but for the most part, never as many problems inside the port Subic Bay okay. as we had the first time. Mm -hmm. So um, I still remember that, whether it was a challenge or an opportunity or what it right. was. But um, everything went pretty much, we had a few problems with bad weather, and I have the pictures that show the difficulty of, of hose that comes back mm -hmm. and all of that. But for the most part, I would say we had a, you know, a relatively successful tour. Um, so you're called back for this period of time. So we were called back, and I remember one of the biggest honors that I was ever given was to bring the ship home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So where was, was that back to San Francisco yeah. or, yeah? So I brought it under the Golden Gate Bridge. Okay. Uh, now again, you would have pilots. Again, mm -hmm. we did a lot. Thank goodness that's another thing we should say because sometimes uh, you can't bring an oiler into, like in a Subic Bay, or you can't bring it into a port along the Vietnamese coastline mm -hmm. without having pilots. Mm -hmm. So I should always tell you, tugboat pilots and all those crew that were part of those riverine mm -hmm. forces, um, 
along with the PBRs, which we can talk more about. Those are the patrol river boats, mm -hmm. and uh, they're the ones that actually went up the coastline each mm -hmm. and every day um, for the Navy, and um, they're, they're probably were the best trained of anybody. But um, to get back home, you had to have those pilots, but I got it back, and what an honor mm -hmm. to be given the opportunity to bring the ship home, at least for that watch when we when we got there okay um and other i guess we're kind of trying to generally following your, your story here in order so you got other sort of stories from uh the natchez that you haven't gotten into yet that you want to bring onto the record well um part of them was kind of like the extension of the difficulties with the military police that we had mm -hmm. in um in in uh in the Hong Kong, it was continued mm -hmm. in in Subic Bay. Okay, there was um, it was a very difficult spot. You can read all you want about Subic Bay; it's a story in itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, open sewage, all sorts of stuff, and you can just imagine what it's living like there, in with completely marginalized people who, you know, were looking for handouts and everything else. So. Um, very difficult to immerse in a friendly way on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. So we had our degrees of difficulty and we did suffer some significant consequences, but most ships had those inside Subic Bay. So Subic Bay was the stopping point for all the Seventh Fleet right. activities as it was going over there, but it grew. Um, but I was always most concerned in the stories present themselves about the behavior that actually took place there. And I saw some things that I just didn't think I'd see before about how to treat people. And that will always leave a memory too, of just decency. And, and you can talk about the bar fights, you can talk about all that, but it goes beyond. And so all of a sudden, it was like, what's the life value? What's the value of a person? Mm -hmm. And at times you would see people where there was no way. People didn't look like they didn't care. Yes. I so guess I'd never seen that, right? Mm -hmm. You're brought up, go to college, people value things, and then all mm -hmm. of a sudden, what's the value of life? <laughs> it's an yeah. interesting question. Uh, I don't know. Did you have any uh, tailors who went into town and never came back? Yep. I mean, it's known for the bars and the prostitution and the yep. rest of it, as well as crime and various things that can happen if you're not careful. They did. They did. Mm -hmm. So that's the, you just described it. That's the trail. Okay. And when you would think that, well, let's just take that point for mm -hmm. a minute and reflect upon it. You think you're now in friendly territory. But what did you just say? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you said they go ashore, they drink, there's prostitution, there's crime, and then they never came back? What's the difference of that versus somebody who just lost their life serving out in Yankee Station? Where are we losing lives? We're losing them in lots of places, I mm -hmm. guess is the, yeah. the best piece that I can describe. So um, I was seeing more of the other side of that than people who were actually in the combative side, right. although I did get a very good taste of what that was. but. Mm -hmm. There was more things on the other side of the equation than I was ever imagined. Okay. Now, by the time the Natchez now gets back uh, to California, mm -hmm. are you pretty close to being done with your active <laughs> duty at that point? <laughs> That's when something memorable happened. So, um, I had spent time, I think I told you, with my wife. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I was given the opportunity to ship over again and uh, go to the next area of training, which was Coronado Beach for river patrol boat. Mm -hmm. That's what was next. Mm -hmm. And my wife had the opportunity of saying, if the Navy is your career and this is where you're going, Maybe I'll go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So today she's still my strongest support, mm -hmm. and I do. And she allowed me to continue the Navy a little bit more, which we could 
chat briefly yeah. about, but that was the line of demarcation for me. Okay. So I had to, although you asked me before, first question, did mm -hmm. I have, and the answer is, yeah, I probably would have. I probably would have given it to myself. Mm -hmm. So she was looking much further into it than I was. Because once you get into this, it becomes, oh, I hate to say it, a lifestyle. Yeah. It's a lifestyle. So now all of a sudden I had had one lifestyle, platform mm -hmm. launching lifestyle. Now I'm in the lifestyle. And of course, what does the Navy want? They want people who have had a launching lifestyle, mm -hmm. have seen what this is, they don't want to take on as many rookies anymore. Mm -hmm. Very, very hard decision. Okay. All but right. I made it. Okay. So now, uh, how much time did you have then left on active duty at that point? Um, as soon as I said no, they processed me pretty quick. Okay. It wasn't like, well, let's sit around and talk about old times because mm -hmm. they were preparing for their next deployment mm -hmm. and then they also were looking for these river patrol boat. Right. They usually were captained by a lieutenant. Mm -hmm. So they had a small complement, but um, those were officers and they usually had a warrant officer with them and in the deck and those. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, those were the inshore riverine forces, mm -hmm. a separate task force. Yep. But that was part of what could have come next or, mm -hmm. or staying aboard the Neches just to do another deployment. So that was all in that mix. And right. when you're out there by yourself, and so she did come. So my wife did come to see the ship brought back. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that was a commitment. So, because when you do this and you just say, you never know, you just don't know. So there was this period of time and so she made the commitment to come out and at least see. So, now, were you married at this time, yeah. or that come okay. you, yeah. you had met before? So, you, and then did you correspond yeah. while you were on the ship? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. just to stay in touch. But, uh, uh, yeah, you just that was not a good thing to do until mm -hmm. you figured out whether your feet's on really good ground or not. Mm -hmm. So, yes, so that was the decision made back in um, and. June of 67. Okay. So I did track my release there. Okay. All right. So once you're off active duty, you're still in the active reserve then? Right. For so I still have more years to, to finish out. Right. So, but once you're sort of off active duty, did you go back to school, get a job? What did you do? Right. So uh, now all of a sudden, you know, I do get married. So that followed almost. Mm -hmm you know, within the next period of time, because mm -hmm. that's where the decision was made. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did get a job, and um, one of the things being, I had a background in chemistry, so when I first came through, knowing that I might get out, um, I had looked at several companies and sort of processed myself. So Dow Chemical mm -hmm. was the, the first job I got. So now I have a job. But now I actually go for active duty training. So mm -hmm. now you're in the active part of the USNR. Mm -hmm. So now I'm assigned ACDUTRA in the same time frame, latter part of 67 in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So now I have part of a unit that is on active reserve. Mm -hmm there in New Jersey, which is where I was for my job. Okay. And so what was your unit in New Jersey doing? All right. So this is a whole nother story and it's bittersweet because I, I look back on it today, not sure I made all the right decisions, but there was a couple of things that turned my decision and you can share those because the, it's nationally known. So mm. the, um, Active duty is, is basically a reserve center, so it's a physical location mm -hmm. in which you all spend a certain amount of weekends right. and a certain amount of week uh, during the summer, a couple of weeks away. So that started, and it's called the Ready Reserve. Mm -hmm. So after entering that, so for probably the late 60s to early 70s, I spent summers aboard and I think I can get most of these. A couple of Oilers. So Calusa Hatchie, AO98. 
Um, let's see, let me get them in consequence. Uh, USS Trenton and the Truckee, another oiler, AO-167. U.S. Newport, an LST, 1179. So these were usually ships that were home ported. They could be out at sea mm -hmm. during employment. Half of them were, half of them were just in port. You would spend two weeks during the time frame. So it was all staying in a prepared readiness state. Right. If, in fact, you were ever called up, which we weren't. So that continued on. Now, during this time frame, in 69, I became lieutenant, mm -hmm. and at the same time became um, an administrative officer for this unit. And then um, I became the EXO of this unit, mm -hmm. uh, executive officer um, of this unit in um, 1974. But then, so I was staying very engaged, mm -hmm. and I actually looked at a fitness report <laughs> that I have, mm -hmm. a couple of fitness reports, and I, you know, it was interesting how people look at you back then. Written these, but I had them in my jacket. I think mm -hmm. I told you I brought my jacket. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at my jacket like, what did anybody think about this? So I read a couple of the fitness reports. If I had really l probably looked at them the way I looked, I would have stayed in and gotten my 20, mm -hmm. but I didn't. And the rub was this, is there was about 250,000 that were in active duty getting paid to, mm -hmm. to do all this. And then we had the executive officer by you know what president that mm -hmm. sort of said, we're just cutting back the reserves. We're just scratching out pay and that's it. Mm -hmm. And you know who that one was. So um, that took all the wind out of my sails because that means the only thing you're doing is going down there one weekend a month mm -hmm. two weeks during the summer you're not getting paid and what does all that mean because now you've taken all these units off active reserve and then you're just pushing paper and pencils so that sort of came to light and I went in inactive standby reserve in 1978. Mm -hmm. Now I'm in a different state so I've come from the East Coast Navy to the West Coast Navy to active duty to inactive mm -hmm. and so do I want to stay? So I had to ask myself a question at the time um, was this the best use of my time and mm -hmm. I made the decision is I wasn't going to waste it. I was going to go back and get an MBA. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. But I was just talking about my wife last night before I got here, and mm -hmm. I said, you know, after reading all this stuff, what everybody thought, I don't know whether I made the right decision or not. Okay. But you did mention that the, so the people who were, the reserves were not getting paid. But you were still showing up, but they had to paid. show up. You had, had to show up. At the, well, at inactive, the, as long as you were there, that was means you're just getting your retirement pieces. Yeah. You're not getting paid for doing anything. Before, you were being paid for something. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think so they took under Clinton's watch, which was starting to get in there. I believe mm -hmm. that's how it all started late into that period. Mm -hmm. But that was when the times when, when they shrunk the size of the ready reserve. Mm -hmm and shut down many of the ready reserve units, put some of them on an active status. And that's mm -hmm. where all that churn started for me. And then I wound up Did now, you mean Carter rather than Clinton? I'm trying to remember. I don't know, 19, Carter was 19, 85. Car yeah. Carter is I'm 77 to, to 81. I'm the president that decreed all this. I think it was in the reserves, because he, when, when was Carter, 85? No, no, Carter is, ap is after Ford. So Carter is 77 to 81. All right, so it may be Carter, but I'm trying to remember who took, who took it? Who followed that piece right after them? You have Carter, and then you have Reagan and Bush, and then Clinton's, and Clinton's not until the 90s. Somebody yeah. had took out, maybe it was Clinton, because I, I guess, uh, excuse me, he was the one who took out my, I'm sorry, I have him on in my mind. Mm -hmm. He was the one who took out uh, my brother-in-law, who was a captain. So mm -hmm. he was the same same issue. Yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. got a name. So his name, because he, he stayed in for 20, my brother-in-law. So. Right. 
yes, it would have been this, but it was the shrinking at the time mm -hmm. of this national, I mean, of these uh, active, what they call the ACT-DUTRA programs. Right. And that's when I had to make a decision on whether mm -hmm. I just wanted to stay the, the next, because I was halfway there, mm -hmm. to stay for these next 10 years um, and just do the retirement points or whether I could use my time better. And that was the decision right. that I made. So that's, um, and then in, um, I think I was formally discharged in October of 1982. Okay. All right. Uh, now, to, to look at the time that you spent in the Navy, what do you think you took out of that, or how did that affect you? Well, that's, a, that's probably worth more of the conversation than just some highlights of what you went through. Um, well, first of all, I had no idea what the difference was between responsibility and accountability was. We throw those terms away. Like, it's your responsibility, but who's accountability? So I learned what accountability means in the Navy, that responsibility. Mm -hmm. I could delegate you my responsibility, but not my accountability. I don't know where I could have learned that lesson. Mm -hmm. Where does the buck actually stop? Mm -hmm. That's what I learned. So that was one important lesson. Um, I would say another big lesson in that is this whole area that we talk about today is this journey. Everybody wants to reach a destination point and say that you're, I've accomplished this and accomplished that. I don't know a better set of tools that I could have been given that allowed me to have the journey I've had. Mm -hmm. Never knew that at that time. So it's a toolbox mm -hmm. of what do you do under rapid fire? What do you do in the middle of the night? What do you do, what do you do, what do you do? So developing game plans, working with people, relying on people, I mean, it's, it's all there. But you can put people through all the exercises and put it, but unless you've done that on a mm -hmm. consistent, consistent basis. So I never looked at it. I didn't spend tours and tours, and I wasn't mm -hmm. in hand-to-hand, -hand, but I'm walking away not knowing what you're asking me today, but as you reflect back, I don't think I could have progressed on the career that I had done without having that. So there were some inspirations. Um, my my brother-in-law is a retired full captain. He was unable to make um, Admiral, mm -hmm. but uh, he was a fighter pilot off a carrier. So there's a real guy. Mm -hmm. So he stayed and we talked a lot. So he was always um, kind of like, a, um, you know, you always have somebody in your family. And uh, my wife's dad, you know, he was the one who stormed the beach. Mm -hmm. So very quiet, both of them. So you learn in your family roots. And so service became, to me, an important part. I don't, didn't think I looked at service to the country like I look at it today. and. Um, you could ask me the question, does it bother me what we're doing? Absolutely. Absolutely. This sense of honor today is, I don't know how anybody even defines it when you see what's going on, but do you look at these people that served? And um, as I was saying, one of the most momentous things that I've seen recently is this recent PBR broadcast on Memorial Day mm -hmm. for an hour and a half. My eyes glistened listening to those stories. Mm -hmm. Every family, school member, school kid ought to see that. Only takes an hour and a half out of your life. Mm -hmm. Listen to people. They, they couldn't even tell their own stories, so they use actors, James, to tell the stories. And then they had the people there. Mm -hmm. who, and um, these are some that have been maimed for life and yet have rehabilitated themselves. Mm -hmm. Others that have served but are missing still today. Just wonderful stories about how our country's been built, and we seem to gloss over this today and don't understand what honor and respect is. So I'm, I'm not sure when you look back on what I experienced, I didn't see the respect. I saw the honor mm -hmm. of serving, mm -hmm. but the respect I didn't necessarily see. So one vivid impression 
that also remains with me is I told you that I uh, worked for Dow Chemical first. Mm -hmm. So when it came out, I was given the opportunity to go to Midland, Michigan for a year mm -hmm. and to see whether or not I was fit for duty to serve Dow Chemical. And you say, well, that's easy once you're employed. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the reason why I did that was I came fully trained. Dow had the best training program mm -hmm. of any of the chemical companies. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you, if you're a rookie, want to get trained mm -hmm. the best? So I stayed in Midland for the better part of a year before they actually allowed me to go talk to anybody. I thought that was kind of neat. When I did, my first job was in the Northeast, which is back where my mm -hmm. area was. So I remember today walking in to the Dow offices in New York and seeing on the inside of the glass windows burnt children from Nepal mm -hmm. and people maimed by Agent Orange. I didn't recover for a while. Well, what I there? was really now, you know, I sort of begin to separate myself from what I had been through mm -hmm. to try to get myself. I, I always uh, used the term, you know, I, I was taking, uh, I had, after being on active duty and having all these Navy terms, I, I coined my new part of my life after I left the service, even though I was still active, I was just active duty for civilian life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So that was my terminology, my bridge. Well, when I first went to work, that bridge fell apart. Because I'm now working for a company where people are out there every day of the week bringing the company down because they participated with the development of Napalm and Agent Orange. Mm -hmm. now, uh, of course, in, when you first are joining the late 60s, early 70s, there's not really much public about Agent Orange. It's not... It's not the pictures were there. You could see the pictures. They were hung. When I went in there in 1960, well, maybe beginning, now this may be 68, 69, yeah. the pictures of what napalm effects had. Yeah, yeah. napalm you would see. Right. That was that was. So immediate. that was there. You could see yeah. those pictures followed by, but the pictures were pretty descriptive. Mm -hmm. And so now all of a sudden I have flash memories of a piece I didn't necessarily see, but were a part. And so that created just a degree of instability because now you're serving a com company who had manufactured this product and what was its role? And now it's like, oh, you're gonna revisit this. So there was a several year period in there where I had to get my sea legs back together mm -hmm. again. I went through the same couple year period of not quite sure what I was doing, why I was doing it, but uh, fortunately I was surrounded by some good people that were able to, to do that. But that, those flash memories backwards with that picture still sit very vivid with me. Okay. And, uh, I just remember walking up that long staircase in the city and it was glass and this and there were those pictures. And they were actually putting up pictures of the effects of what they made. All right. Uh, now, of course, you come back and now it's like, you know, 67, then you go to 68, 69 and so forth. Kind of get into the whole era of the, the peak of the anti-war movement. Uh, did that register much with you or did you pay much attention to it or was I that... I did, but I went silent. I just... Uh, And I got kind of, and I can tell you how I got brought back, it's really because of Grand Valley and the LZ mm -hmm. <laughs> Vietnam piece. I went silent um, and there were so many questions that were there about why we did stuff and we actually probably online could have come up with some better thoughts, but we just knew and wondered why. And it's, of course, it's, li it's a lot like it was a very difficult war to fight because we knew nothing of the territory. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it's like, how do you do warfare mm -hmm. along a coastline like that where you basically don't have any experience being there before? It's kind of like the 
current situations where mm -hmm. you're now in desert types conditions but never been there and so there was all of that uh, it was all a question of whether you were actually equipped to do because we were working with nothing more than what we had previously mm -hmm. fought with we knew there was upgrades in technology so you wonder where that was and then you saw the whole issue of purpose and then I didn't really follow the war that greatly with what was happening south and okay, be careful about hitting your microphone uh, by the way. in south in Dixie Station mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. starting to look at that whole area of of uh, the whole fall period in the new documentary that came out. So mm -hmm. that, that piece was kind of not there, but very historically mm -hmm. important, but I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. So I just felt like I'd served, I got my feet back on the ground, I'd stayed in the reserves, I'd done my time. But yet, um, came to Grand Valley and been there for a while and then all of a sudden what happened was you know I got a little bit more in WGVU and then I saw a little bit more about what happened and then the LZ Vietnam came mm -hmm. several years ago I had never been to anything mm -hmm. nothing and then all of a sudden I went it was very interesting very few Navy people there but mm -hmm. um, the people I saw again brought back the service side and the pride side mm -hmm. of looking at these people who were the combatants and so the marines were there army was there few air force uh, not very many navy um, and then all of a sudden you saw where the difference really was being made and why the war was fought but it wasn't from everybody telling it it was really the experience of what all those went through I. I don't talk about it at all. I mean, it was a long time just to get to where we are today, so mm -hmm. I only have a little piece of this whole puzzle. Mm -hmm. But I, um, I do think the service to our country is critically important, and I'm glad I went through what I did. Mm -hmm. I know I was prepared. I didn't quite know what I was being prepared for, but the preparation was there. So I took that after I got my feet re back on the ground mm -hmm. with some others. And I, I use those experiences very well, but I didn't wind up with the haunting memories mm -hmm. that some have had. And those memories start to come out when you see some of those people like at the LZ Michigan, mm -hmm. and they, they're haunted to this day. Yep. And I am so thankful to God that I didn't have those haunting pieces. I do, I mean, that, that little issue I shared with Dow mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. that was a flashback. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have too many of those, but I, I walked away with it with service to the country for a period of time, which I learned something that I could use elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, um, what I learned, I was able to use in mm -hmm. knowing how to work with people and trying to get them set in the right direction in, in my business career. So I stayed in the chemical industry mm -hmm. uh, for my life. And it... Um, now you know, it's kind of interesting because you can talk to people who are now our students and you say, hey, you're in the chemical industry. And some of them say, oh, you're the one that still to this day, like you're mm -hmm. the one that had all the pollutants and everything mm -hmm. else. So perceptions and images follow you. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating to me um, when you talk to people who don't know anything about the war, what image do you have in perception? And then to some that do. Mm -hmm. And I still think the storytelling is what makes this whole picture the most truthful and representable mm -hmm. account that you can find. Yep. And so I commend you for taking the time in the History Project to get as many of these voices mm -hmm. together uh, because voices left alone don't necessarily give you uh, the, the voice you're looking for. It's the collective voice mm -hmm. that makes the big difference because we were looking for collective voices mm -hmm. and wondered where they were. Yep. Why were we being exposed to this? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I didn't even go into, I, I mean, just picture this. So these are, again, a little flashback just came. So I'd go into Subic Bay, and I knew what pieces of gear we need to go back out on line, or if we're in a port along the coastline or something. I knew the pieces of gear. So I learned a terminology I will never forget called Comshaw. Have you ever heard of the word Comshaw? Don't think so. It's to borrow with the intent never to return. Ah. So what's a better word for 
borrowing with the intent never to return, steal mm -hmm. from our own people. Mm -hmm. So you'd go into a supply and you'd look at stuff and if you knew you were going to need it, take two. So all of a sudden, it's these kinds of scenarios of preparedness. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, if you're not going to be prepared, I'm certainly going to be prepared. So you don't learn you know, that in a textbook. Mm -hmm. So this is cultural behavioral thing. So there's a lot on the behavioral side of what you experience during that time frame that I'll never, ever, ever forget. Mm -hmm. And I just, that was just something that came to mind. Yep. It's like, how do you, do you just put simple requests in? Oh yeah, but how do you really get this stuff? You barter, mm -hmm. you trade. right? And that's all part of this. It's like, okay, that was part of the deal too. So those are all this background of experiences mm -hmm. that you all go through, but that's real live, right? Yeah. Because you get out online for 30 days, what are you gonna do if something breaks down? You better have another one. Mm -hmm. Specifically if you're underway replenishing, right? Right. Yeah. Can't yeah. wait for another valve to work. Yeah. You know, you gotta go get it. Uh, did you learn that kind of thing from the senior enlisted? Yeah. They're very, very, very good at that kind of that, thing. Oh, they were awesome. So it's like, okay, but I, I don't think um, the chief that we had aboard, the oiler, I, I never gave him to this day. I wish I could meet him. I don't know whether he's alive or today or what, but I wish I w could have thanked him better because he, he made me what I was. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I ever looked him in the eye and said that, but I sure wish I could. Chief Doyle. All right. Chief awesome, Doyle. awesome guy. And... Uh, he was the steady Eddie through all this, like, yeah, like, hey, tell me, how does this really work? Mm -hmm. But he was there, and uh, he was the one that always made that, um, what we called our division. That was us, the R division. He was the one that could always make that work, and he's in the, he's mm -hmm. in the book. And I just look back, and I'm saying, boy, you know, if you have to look at somebody who really made this thing go, mm -hmm. to your point, it was those senior petty officers. Mm -hmm. He was as good as it gets. Calm, steady under all conditions. And here we are trying to jump around doing it like. So that calming influence, not only from Captain Millar, but from, I mean, you just, you can't find that. Because mm -hmm. you always hear the other side of. So I was blessed with having some calming influence to go through what we did. Right. And without it, I would say, now you're in a highly reactive mode. So they were being able to proactively put into you what to expect. Mm -hmm. And of course, the anticipation, and if you get it right, is half the game. Yeah. It's like, what are we going to get for this next four hour period? What is it going to really look like? And they, they were very good at that. So those are all pieces of this mm -hmm. kind of like journey. But I, I guess I'd, I look back on it as a journey, right? You, it was like one step and a big one. Mm -hmm because you're fresh out of college and how do you learn accountability, responsibility, all of this in short order mm -hmm. is how you do it. All right. Well, I'll tell you, it makes for a good story. So thank you very much for coming in and sharing it today. Oh, you're welcome. All thank right. you.